Hi, everyone. I'm Lev Ryshenko, and uh, welcome uh, to the fifth lecture in the series and Extended Family. Thanks a lot for joining us today. These talks are part of a year-long project at CCA called Catching Up With Life, which is organized around a question as social structures evolve and values and rituals change, how is architecture keeping up? So there's a book, there's an exhibition, and in this public program, we're focusing on uh, the theme of family through an architectural lens, uh, kind of in, in anticipation of, of the book and exhibition, which uh, arrived in the fall. Um, and family is a very rich uh, topic. It's not possible to talk about it without talking about society. Social definitions underlie most of our political positions. So talking about family can quickly lead to talking about many other things. It's a great thread to pull on, for example. Um, in the North American context in particular, family values is this very loaded term that's often used, uh, particularly by right-wing politicians, to activate anxieties about social change. Uh, invoking the family as an image can be used to build a dynamic of inside and outside, public and private, native and foreign, and other drawing other such boundaries. And this rhetoric is uh, particularly common, I think, today uh, in many different countries, um, partially because we're struggling um, about how to address a global uh, climate crisis and a pandemic uh, in terms of whether to, to do it together or to take care of our own first. And I think many, many political, uh, contemporary political questions and positions could be reframed as uh, sort of answers to the question, who do you consider part of your family? Uh, of course, there have always been many kinds of families, um, though only some were sanctioned by legal systems or celebrated in art or incorporated into architectural or urban imaginings as the sort of normal inhabitants for homes and cities. And today we're more aware than ever, I think, of this multiplicity, but we're still living largely with the 20th century social and physical inheritance, especially certain uh, enduring uh, myths like the idea of the nuclear family. Meanwhile, society and architecture are transforming uh, at different rates, and we can see that parts of contemporary life uh, are sort of misaligned, maybe with the spaces or, or structures they occupy. One of the one of the changes that's easier, I think, to identify is the acceptance of a, of a greater variety of family configurations. Um, but this is always somehow a blur, as uh, Naomi Stead has written. Um, it's a quote. Uh, what used to seem progressive becomes commonplace. What was daring becomes tame. What was queer becomes ordinary. Such are the processes of normalization and such processes calcify in architectural form. So we're looking at this issue uh, in a series where we've been hearing from experts on historical encounters between architecture and ideas of the family. And these case studies uh, have been sort of juxtaposed with uh, more contemporary talks that look at the, the environment today for evidence of changing our extended families or new ways of looking at them. So we started with the invention of the family room uh, in the mid-century American suburb and sort of saw how this typology was changed. Then we continued with the reading of boarding houses, which were a problematic phenomenon for the 19th century sort of emerging ideal of the bourgeois home. Then we followed uh, Venezuelan domestic workers as they sort of moved from the back of the employer's home uh, to their own houses, sort of through the Chavez revolution. And uh, last week, we turned to the ways that Mexican domestic architecture embodies a sort of hidden logic of exclusion um, of domestic labor. And today we're, we're continuing to look at, at family, domestic spaces, and reproductive labor. And joining us live from Philadelphia, uh, I'm very happy to have Sophie Lewis, a feminist theorist, cultural critic, and utopianist. Um, she's author of the book Full Surrogacy Now, Feminism Against Family, um, as well as uh, many articles and essays, including the magnificent, you've probably read My Octopus Girlfriend, She's currently a, a visiting scholar at the Alice Paul Center for Research uh, on Gender, Sexuality, and Women at the University of Pennsylvania, and she teaches um, open online courses at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. We also have a new book coming out, which I hope you'll mention at the end. So thanks for listening to me. Thank you, Sophie, for joining us, and over to you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks to uh, Lev and everyone at the CCA uh, for this kind introduction. Um, and as is customary to do here, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Leni Lenape people. Um, I uh, realize that my title is rather far from pithy, um, and I will let you <laughs> take a second to read it while explaining that um, this unfamiliar 
I imagine, phrase, the gestational workplace is precisely intended to kind of open up this difficult question uh, that in some senses the field of social reproduction theory is all about, which is uh, where do we do the labor uh, of so-called reproduction, uh, which is uh, a concept I am in a sense deeply skeptical of. Um, and so uh, while, while not at all um, implying uh, that there is, you know, uh, no no use for the term reproductive labor or the, the the theorizing that goes on under that aegis. I like to, in general, in my work, experiment with what happens uh, when we talk about gestational um, productivity and anti-productivity instead. Um, so <laughs> this will be um, the structure, more or less, of uh, this talk. Um, I have to say, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed about my decision to go with the Alice in Wonderland uh, imaginary, given how incredibly overdone, in a sense, it is in culture. Um, but having said that, I, I think um, I can uh, make a case for them being um, sort of accidentally, uh, latently uh, family abolitionist uh, scenarios and uh, and situations to think with. Um, I will talk a little bit about who the hell I am for those of you who don't know, although I'll, I'll be very brief with that given Lev's very kind introduction. Um, I'll uh, touch on my uh, sort of key concepts of amniotechnics and um, that infamous proposal of the communists, um, abolition of the private nuclear household. And then, uh, given that this is an architecture um, forum and series, uh, I will attempt to talk a little bit about utopian feminist architecture and the question of kitchenlessness. Um, and at the end, I'll note that it's really important, um, unpalatable and cantankerous as it may sound, to stay anti-capitalist when we talk about uh, critiques of the family or the idea of kitchenlessness. And uh, I'll, I'll close up with uh, a case for reclaiming utopianism, which will take us through my friend and comrade, uh, M.E. O'Brien's uh, Six Steps to Abolish the Family, which uh, begins paradoxically uh, with a kitchen. Um, so in my general <laughs> style, I end up with something a little bit like kitchen workers against the kitchen. Um, which is a direct analog to real families against the family, if you like. So um, to get the sort of justification for Alice um, out of the way, <laughs> uh, there are so many moments in the Alice imaginary of escape from private architecture and also um, uncanny scenes of birthing. Uh, for example, you may remember when that lizard uh, Bill is expressed out of the chimney of the White Rabbit's respectable suburban home by the force of, you know, gigantic Alice's trapped squashed body, or uh, when the tea, the the dormouse is uh, at the tea, at the tea party is kind of squashed in a kind of reverse birth uh, back into a teapot. Um, but again and again, Alice struggles with the rules of the property regime of humanness and kinship and Victorian propriety from up there above ground. Um, and, but she almost, um, to her own surprise, uh, refuses to keep house and sort of repeatedly bursts free uh, of domestic architecture. For example, suddenly growing in size as in pregnancy or shrinking kind of queerly so as to be able to flee uh, or evade legibility. And in one scene, she grows so tall, she is interpreted by a mother bird uh, as a serpent threatening the nest eggs. Um, but perhaps above all, Alice finds multiple spaces uh, where food and drink are generated outdoors um, by and for the commons, a mode of social reproduction turned upside down. At one point, 
a silent but furious proletarian cook is stirring a steaming pot full of soup and a duchess is sitting nearby breastfeeding and the pepper from the soup is overpowering which seems to me an indication that the cook is a, a sort of uh racialized figure uh, a sort of colonized uh threatening figure the ceiling starts closing in um, the cook starts throwing pots and pans at the suckling infant the pots and pans dissolve the walls as they fly through the air and the duchess rises from her seat thrusts the bundle into alice's arms for safekeeping uh, and wanders blithely away as the ruling classes inevitably do this is the bad sense of surrogacy when alice looks down at the bundle she discovers the baby has turned into a piglet uh, in full surrogacy now, I'm centrally concerned with both the unromantic character of gestational labor and its ubiquitousness, i.e. the continuity between the labors of the kitchen and the labors of the literal uterus. We are all the makers of one another. And although that might sound kind of sweet, it's actually also rather unpleasant and scary. Um, that is why I think there's a useful sort of queer realism in this image, where we could understand queer realism as an antagonist of capitalist realism and or domestic realism. In fact, paradoxically, this queer realism is a sort of pragmatic utopianism. I would like to ask what might you turn into if you were placed in someone else's arms to nurse? What if you were placed in everybody's arms at the same time as everybody was placed in yours? What does Wonderland look and feel like in your vision of children's liberation? I wanna make clear that while I've been inspired to think about family abolitionist architecture by, uh, in the first instance, these illustrations um, for Lewis Carroll by, John Tenniel, uh, the aristocratic and racist conservative cartoonist for the, Victor for the Victorian magazine Punch, um, and also um, by the 1951 movie by the anti-communist uh, white supremacist Disney movie production company, um, and uh, to a lesser extent, much, much more recently, uh, by the multinational conglomerate Pirelli's global fashion calendar with its uh, black Alice in Wonderland theme. I am in no way suggesting that any of these artists really, or any of these authors merit revisiting in their own right. I'm only interested in a sort of accidental or latent, perverse, anti-familial, feminist, decolonial, uh, and as especially uh, what I will later explain as amniotechnical, watery, boundary making and unmaking uh, resonance in these images. And I like the premise that girls and their desires are too big for private property. Plus, <laughs> I have been using this particular image of Alice busting out of a house for, for family abolition related full surrogacy now events for years. And I figured it was time to actually uh, talk about them explicitly. Um, I will <laughs> additionally admit that I am a bit partial to the puns uh, whereby Victorian domestic items grow wings and turn fugitive. So in this case, we have the bread and butter fly. Um, and the rocking horse fly. Um, also, <laughs> Lewis Carroll, despite having no artistic talent, um, actually had a go at illustrating the underground perversities of his Alice protagonist himself. And it's all very amniotic and insurrectionary, as you can see. And it seems to me that despite its kitchification and recuperation, a still potentially useful kernel um, of the Alice imaginary um, as a children's liberation story, is its unpleasant, confusing, disorienting, and sometimes horror 
adjacent affect. The horror genre in cinema in general is often very latently um, uh, and sometimes explicitly family abolitionist in my opinion, basically because um, bourgeois white homesteads and patriarchal maternities come under pleasurable attack there so often, or in the rare cases where a filmmaker has the means to explore the afterlives of Black American kinlessness, uh, to invoke Hortense Spillers, Sadia Hartman, um, and others. Um, horror can be um, a darkly utopian exploration of what it means to lose your kin, in Christina Sharp's phrase. In other words, um, this is a space in which one can feel how painful it is to be misrecognized as a drab species of flower. It can be humiliating to lose one's language and misremember the words of a poem from one's childhood, especially in front of a caterpillar who keeps asking, who are you? Falling out of one's family tree can be disorienting. Anyway, as for me, who am I? <laughs> I'm gonna race through this. Um, I wrote a book called Full Surrogacy Now as well as a kind of accidental essay about the erotics of a Netflix octopus documentary. Um, I teach online courses with the Brooklyn Institute, as Lev said. Um, and when I was really broke, as opposed to just quasi broke, I used to do translations from German to English, including The Future of Difference, which is about Islamophobic feminisms in Germany, Communism for Kids by Beanie Adam Schack, and A Brief History of Feminism by Antje Schrupp. Um, I'm also in the Out of the Woods Writing Collective. Here are some things um, you can watch of mine on YouTube. There are a hell of a lot of things at this point. Um, I wanted to just point out the, the things I've published during the pandemic, specifically on this topic. Um, it was quite extraordinary to me how much editors were willing to take seriously the idea of abolition of the private nuclear household after even only a few weeks of the experience of lockdown, com you know, compared to the before time. <laughs> Here is another um, take, if you like, um, on the politics of the family under COVID that you can, you can look up. I'm not going to really reproduce um, much of the argument here. Okay, fundamentally, um, it's important not to let this be misunderstood. Um, there are two meanings of uh, my kind of manifesto's call for full surrogacy. Um, there is a descriptive sense um, in which we are in a situation of uh, horrifically intense reproductive stratification um, and the commercial gestational surrogacy industry is indeed uh, one of the ways in which um, capitalist reproduction uh, is, is intensifying. Um, and I spend a lot of my book, um, you know, denouncing um, the violence that takes place for workers inside the commercial gestational surrogacy industry. Um, at the same time, as I make clear that exceptionalizing and isolating particular industries such as sex work and surrogacy for a kind of moral human humanitarian uh, feminist project uh, is ultimately um, anti-liberatory and carceral. The prescriptive sort of utopian sense of the call for full surrogacy now um, is a call for a kind of uh, transcendence of the meaning um, or at least the stability of the term surrogate. If we were all, uh, as it were, uh, uh, transgenerationally um, uh, mothering one another, it, the, the, the proprietary sense in which one could be a surrogate, i.e. a stand-in for uh, the legitimate biogenetic uh, property that is kinship uh, under the current regime, there would be a sort of uh, a, a reciprocal uh, surrogacy that would ultimately explode um, that the, the story that we tell and which the, the capitalist surrogacy industry shores up um, about the family. Um, I've made a little collage for you here of uh, phrases uh, from uh, mainly the second half um, of Full Surrogacy Now, which turns uh, to the more positive project having 
dealt with the kind of uh, concrete case studies of the Akanksha clinic in India and the sort of philanthro capitalist girl boss um, who sells surrogacy on a global market um, and calls it feminism, much to the uh, delight of figures like Oprah. Um, but this is the sort of part of the book where I, uh, I try to get, as it were, um, amniotechnical. Um, I should note before going on and explaining what I mean by that, that on the left you have the paperback uh, cover and the paperback is finally coming out uh, next month um, if you are interested in picking up a copy. Um, amniotechnics um, is a really strange term that came to me and which I coined really experimentally initially in an essay in the New Inquiry in 2017 um, and which then sort of evolved into a piece, um, a different kind of piece of writing for the final chapter of the book. And it designates essentially the denaturalization uh, of boundary making that is happening all the time. It's not to say uh, at all um, that I am arguing for a sort of politics of euphoria about boundarylessness. Um, in fact, um, you know, while there are sort of some hydro feminisms, quote unquote, circulating at the moment, which have somewhat of that sort of uh, post genomic um, you know, uh, liberal academic euphoria about um, the loss of, uh, you know, uh, boundaries and, and leakiness and the kind of composting of, uh, of bodies uh, as though that were liberatory or emancipatory per se. I'm trying to make a case for the, the, the drawing of political lines um, with technical skillfulness. Um, we need to wage um, class war, <laughs> uh, a war against whiteness, a war against coloniality, um, and a war against uh, gender regimes. Um, uh, but we need to also understand uh, that we are cyborg um, and that the, the, the contaminated character of ourselves and even of our struggles uh, is not something we're going to be able to, to fix. Thus, um, you know, the, the, the question of sort of holding ourselves and letting ourselves go is, is a kind of exhaustingly ubiquitous matter. Um, our wateriness is our surrogacy. Um, amniotechnics is the art of holding and caring even while being ripped into at the same time as being held. It is protecting water and protecting people from water. It, um, it holds not because water is benign and romantic, but actually precisely because it is a kind of frenemy within. Hold water better and kinship might grow between strangers. Release it carefully, lest it drown that kin. Um, there's been some really fantastic uh, exegeses of what on earth I was talking about in amniotechnics, um, including, uh, very illuminatingly for me, uh, by the feminist collective, the Reet London Women's Office, which has kind of mixed and mashed the text uh, to my huge and humbled um, surprise with the, uh, and edification with the uh, early 70s manifesto, uh, Triple Jeopardy from the Third World Women's Alliance. Um, and there's also a, another reprint of it in a kind of beautiful uh, layout um, and, and incredibly artistic design uh, from Archive Books uh, in, in a production by uh, Jennifer Teets with Elise Hunchuk and Margarita Mendez, who may or may not be here. <laughs> um, I can't tell, I can't see any of you. Um, so again, this is a kind of um, an attempt to sort of feel towards um, a politics that would be equally attuned to boundary making as to the, the euphoria of release and leakiness. When is it time to keep a space cervix-like firmly sealed? At what point cervix-like must the wall come down? When is a bandage ready to come off? How can a city be open to strangers and closed to tsunamis? I'm acutely conscious that this, uh, this series is, uh, you know, entitled An Extended Family, which in a sense is a framing that I am uh, in certain contexts um, against. Uh, <laughs> I think the politics of uh, family critique kind of collapses all too often when it uh, becomes 
uh, a sort of recuperative politics of of extended family uh, centered around the marriage form. Um, however, um, I am very sort of uh, happy <laughs> to have my uh, my family abolitionist um, endeavor included in this in this in this series. Um, uh, I uh, I'd like to kind of bring us back a little bit to the fantasies of um, permeation um, and and fugitivity um, that that we have perhaps accidentally in Alice. Um, I want us uh, to, to perhaps think about Alice as a, an avatar uh, of queer and children's liberation, um, as it was known in the utopian long 60s. Um, perhaps um, when we think about Alice and her multi-species comra comrades, we have some sorts of um, uh, purchase on my suggestion um, that it is possible for any of us to learn that it is the holders, not the delusional authors or self-replicators or patenters in this world who truly people it, um, surrogates to the front. Um, I think it's possible to think about the ways in which uh, Alice is constantly uh, standing in and helping out uh, encountered um, creatures on the way as a kind of uh, surrogacy exploration. The next concept, of course, um, that I need to at least uh, <laughs> reassure you about is, is, is family abolition. Um, it goes back to Plato, um, and it was taken up uh, by the utopian socialist uh, Charles Fourier um, in the early 19th century. Famously, it was also the infamous proposal, as I said in my very, very first introduction uh, of the communists uh, in the manifesto of, of Marx and Engels. Um, however, there is a sort of uh, perpetual production of the view that it is um, uh, almost a syntactically impossible combination of words. It is uh, a proposal that uh, evokes the brain explosion emoji on a sort of epic scale. Um, it's as though one is calling for the abolition of gravity. Um, but this is sort of interesting um, because, um, you know, there is actually <laughs> um, an archive um, and a pretty rich um, tradition um, of, of not just philosophizing, but also to an extent, uh, experimental organizing uh, around the question of revolutionizing the private nuclear household. Um, the practice was developed significantly in the phalanxes and phalansteries of the Fourierist, Fourierist uh, movement. Um, and then, you know, uh, politically developed and unsuccessfully argued for ultimately in the Bolshevik context um, by Alexandra Kolontai uh, in the 1910s, and then resurrected in a really serious way in the communist gay and women's liberation movements in the long 60s and crucially, uh, as M.E. O'Brien reminds us in a very long essay on the history of the abolish the family slogan, also by black women uh, in the US, for example, uh, organizing around uh, welfare. Um, but of course the 80s affected um, a systemic project of forgetting and of anti-utopianism. So the texts uh, that I'm showing you here um, come across um, as a kind of fresh uh, uh, beginning with no uh, explicit sort of genealogy or indebtedness to that earlier tradition uh, of abolition in the context of family. Um, in the 21st century, there has been a concerted turn towards radicalizing um, the newly ubiquitous discourses of care, um, which I know Lev has been, uh, like me, uh, quite critical of in some contexts, um, and making clear that any discourse of care that omits to be anti-capitalist will ultimately fail to care for the wretched of the earth at the expense of the capitalist class, insofar as the for-profit care industry is very much a part of the problem. Um, but these, you know, these are wonderful uh, interventions um, in, the, in the sphere of a sort of uh, uncompromising uh, care politics 
Um, however, um, there is also a very small explicit resurgence, um, and I represent uh, one among this tendency. Um, to quote Emmy O'Brien, uh, who is uh, a Brooklyn-based psychoanalyst and family abolitionist writer, a revival of an explicitly family abolitionist project, which is also uh, uncompromisingly attached to the revolutionary project of communism, unlike the attention to the question of uh, family critique that occurred within academic queer theory, theory in the 80s and 90s. Um, here are some of the, you know, uh, pieces, <laughs> uh, groups, public pub publications, um, blogs that are uh, explicitly arguing for um, the abolition of the family as opposed to its uh, reform um, and are willing to use that word. Um, you're probably familiar with the work of Kathy Weeks, um, who is a very famous uh, anti-work um, feminist philosopher, but perhaps you have not heard of the anti-work Black studies scholar and militant Tiffany Latabo King, who is also increasingly interested, as I uh, can discern, um, in what she calls, quote, the possibility of the abolition of the family and its attendant violence in the wake of slavery's and the Moynihan reports modes of surveillance. And one thing that this little new 21st century upsurge of family abolitionism has dedicated relatively little attention to, however, is the question of architecture. In 1970, Shirley Firestone thought about the composition of large non-biogenetic households a little bit, um, but in the 21st century, um, among the few of us that there are, I think M.E. O'Brien is the one who has come closest uh, in her essay, Communizing Care for Pinko Magazine, when she scrutinizes the blueprints for orgiastic phalansteries laid out in the chaotic writings of Fourier. Um, so I am not a scholar of architecture, um, and it occurred to me at the 11th hour in a conversation with Lev that perhaps it makes no sense for me to try uh, to acquire a little bit of architectural fluency in order to speak to you in an architecture forum uh, who are experts um, on this uh, and precisely presumably interested in the sort of non-architectural perspectives I might have. Nevertheless, um, I have had some curiosity all my life about the possibility of a quote unquote feminist city or a quote unquote uh, decolonized urbanism or an indigenous femme futurism but it is to the um, xeno-feminist Helen Hester um, and the dialogues I've been able to have with her since only 2018 um, that I owe uh, my awareness of Dolores Haydn. Um, and in the grand domestic revolution, Haydn, um, as you may in fact probably do know, um, gives an overview of some of the many diverse experiments in domestic design and organization, socialist township building, and quote unquote materialist feminism that were undertaken um, sort of during and mostly after Fourier, um, that is to say from the mid 1800s through to the 1930s. Um, and Haydn has several other books, including one about uh, seven different American utopias, which covers some of the same examples including the one just east of Los Angeles that was praised uh, so, so uh, fully by the, the famous Marxist Mike Davis in his book, City of Quartz, um, and which Haydn is more critical of. But despite the genealogy we have of truly ambitious, albeit always extremely flawed, um, anti-domestic innovation, um, Haydn notes that feminists have generally speaking in more recent years sort of basically come to accept and naturalize the spatial design of the isolated home 
um, which requires an inordinate amount, she says, of human time and energy to sustain uh, as an inevitable part of, of life. So this is exactly what Helen Hester proposes we call domestic realism, um, a phrase I've already mentioned, and which, as I say, is inseparable from the uh, planetary epidemic of capitalist realism that was ushered in by the 80s. Um, these earlier materialist feminists and utopian socialists were often operating uh, in uh, blatantly settler colonial and sometimes explicitly pro-white ways, sometimes led or at least inspired by bourgeois eugenicists uh, like Sh Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, and uh, they devised experiments towards overthrowing or at minimum radically reorganizing heteronormative domesticity, such as collective residential neighborhoods featuring cooperative housekeeping centers and uh, crucially <laughs> kitchenless houses, so-called. And often the feminist architectural idea, wherever it has cropped up, it seems to me, and you know, notwithstanding regional differences, resembles something a bit like a balancery or a, um, or a sort of set of apartment hotels with communal dining rooms and spaces for shared uh, childcare or sort of courtyard housing blocks with common laundries, common parlors, libraries, and a mix of private and common spaces for food preparation. Um, Helen Hester is interested in particular in the example of Red Vienna, the municipal housing project in the interwar years, even though that was not framed uh, explicitly as a feminist reform. And historians of urban planning have of course been um, really clear about the limitations and failures uh, of Red Vienna and related attempts at a kind of material queer realism or utopianism. <laughs> the kibbutz, communes of all kinds, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, critics such as Eve Blau have powerfully criticized the fantasy of any architectural quick fix, right? I mean, I don't know why I'm telling you this. Stressing instead the co-constitutiveness of spatial and social relations. All of that said, I agree with Dolores Hayden and with Helen Hester that there is something to be salvaged about the prizing open of the naturalized private nuclear household for wholesale architectural denaturalization, as long as the racialized sphere of the surrogate, the catering industry, the restaurant, etc., is always and equally held up for critique. It has to be said that a number of the historical examples Haydn explores were purely speculative or overtly fictional and most never made it past the planning stage. At the same time, a number of them were at least partially realized. And as Helen Hester says, um, those that did became, um, of those that did become a concrete reality, the socialization of domestic labor they involved provided some kind of justification for investing in anti-work technologies um, and home technologies, which given the right conditions can support uh, a wider struggle of workers against work. Um, she, I think rightly asks, sort of notwithstanding all the dangers uh, and all the defeats that litter um, the history of feminist urbanism, what can contemporary feminisms hope to inherit, absorb and repurpose uh, from the tradition of socialist and feminist practice? I am fascinated with the ways in which the space of the kitchen has been the privatized, isolated, unlivable gestational workplace that a long tradition of feminists of different types have lashed out against and sought to destroy at the same time as it has been the kitchen table that has proved so fruitful as a gathering place and an organizing node for the insurgent imagination. Think of um, 
kitchen table women of color press, for example, or the, the German press kitchen politics or the classic text wages against housework, counter planning from the kitchen. In the uh, feminist fiction utopia, Women on the Edge of Time, the work of making and sustaining human bodies seems to have been centralized and diffused across the members of the entire society at the same time as specialists are allocated uh, to care um, for children and to take on the labor of quote unquote kid binding as well as technically maintaining the ectogenetic machines in which the fetuses float as an additional layer of expertise. And that's what anti-work politics is in the sphere of the labor of making life. It is not uh, a silver bullet uh, that makes uh, work disappear with a poof. It is a diffusion of labor across the whole of society. Um, so this is the thing I'm ongoingly fascinated by, the simultaneity of decolonial and colonial threads pro and anti-work threads, uh, anti-domestic and um, domestic uh, kind of romantic worker organizing historically. And given these cross contaminations um, by violence of our very selves and even our histories of struggles, as I've noted, I wonder how to make the case knowing full well that it is not really up to me to apologize for or make excuses for deeply racist passages in utopianisms like Shuley Firestones, that it is worth the risk to take back up the horizon of an architecture against private property, an architecture against privatized care, against the privatization of social reproduction. So a brief note then, just to say that there are always going to be uh, popular and centrist uh, uptakes um, and dilutions uh, of the critiques of the family uh, that revolutionaries have uh, developed uh, over the centuries. Um, there will always be uh, a capitalist recuperation uh, of these kinds of critique. Um, I talk about this in my article at The Nation, um, and I worry that there is this folksy sense in which nobody, particularly now during the pandemic, nobody disagrees with the uh, it takes a village line. Uh, there have been so many editorials that comment that the pandemic exposes the myth of the nuclear family, but to be cantankerous about it, <laughs> it is one thing to notice uh, that what one thought were supports, commodified or not, propping up one's you know, structurally integral family are in fact integral to its functioning. And it is an, an, another matter you know, to go beyond that recognition, to go beyond appreciating the nannies, the feminized relatives who you are now missing, to recognizing that the whole disciplinary image and the whole hierarchic functioning of that technology, the family, elevates some lives while devaluing others and needs to be abolished. If the commentariat has this new penchant <laughs> for criticizing the nuclear family, in most cases, these criticisms are still animated by an explicitly kind of uh, neoliberal and perhaps unconsciously also anti-Black contempt for forms of chosen family that eschew marriage and private property. Um, I'm mainly talking about David Brooks here, um, and I, I'm not, I'm not um, sure exactly how far Anna Pujane um, takes um, her critique of the family. Um, I was a little bit concerned by her openness to startup uh, culture and her interviews apparent um, uh, stress on the importance of free choice in the context of uh, you know, transforming social reproduction. Um, certainly um, when The Atlantic published the, this 9,000 word piece by David Brooks, um, it was a case study in neoliberal marriage fundamentalism, full of nostalgia for uh, extended family and quote unquote, 
the time when sisters in law shouted greetings across the street at each other across their porches from their porches. Um, so I just want us to be on our guard because some pundits uh, who are slamming the nuclear family are actually carefully defining it not as a property logic, but as a single generational living decision. And that's the better to ward off more radical contestations of bourgeois reproduction, which become possible in a moment in which, um, for example, in my city, Philadelphia, insurgencies of the unhoused, um, as well as the movements for black lives are seriously challenging um, the, the present state of things. So I'm going to close by taking us through um, Michelle O'Brien's uh, six steps to abolish the family. Um, and I've illustrated them for your amusement uh, with John Tenniel's original illustrations of Alice in Wonderland. So number one, in this spirit of kitchens against the kitchen is set up a protest kitchen. Number two is expand insurgent social reproduction, particularly in the domains of harm reduction um, and medical care. Establish syringe exchanges, Michelle suggests. Provide social care to include those with chronic mental and physical illness. Build communes. Childcare areas become creches where children can learn and grow together over years. Combat the return of the family. Raise children of the commune. At this point, Michelle says, if you have reached this step, you have succeeded in abolishing the family. But in true dialectical style, there is still a sixth step which begins if, you know, global communism does not emerge, do your best with the imperfect options available. Try to form your own collective housing or parenting arrangements when they seem viable. Fight to destroy the white supremacist states which reinforce the violence of the family. Find each other, care for each other, and love each other. Now, because I wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair to simply let Michelle uh, finish up my, uh, <laughs> my lecture for me. I have my own um, <laughs> six step, um, much less uh, sort of thought through uh, uh, experiment for you, which begins with this um, infamous um, commercial, <laughs> which Dolores Hayden talks about in the Grand Domestic Revolution. And as you can see here, Ajax is proposing that a person, implicitly a housewife, quote unquote, swing through spring cleaning uh, with Ajax. And um, the person appears to be outdoors, <laughs> having a beautiful time um, with, a, with a, a portion of a kitchen uh, out among the trees. Um, but <laughs> I actually, uh, I understand that the feminist critique of this uh, is uh, horrified by the gaslighting involved. Um, however, I actually, when I look at this image, I see something fairly promising. Um, of course, we wouldn't want such a lonely situation. We'd want to add, you know, more comrades. We'd probably want to diversify uh, and include multi-species companions. Um, we'd want to add some you know, disability liberation and perhaps some black quantum futurism dynamics to help us dream large and decolonize. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> we'd want it uh, to be in the context um, of a communist <laughs> sensibility that says everything for everyone, omnia sunt communia. Finally, perhaps we could experiment collectively with the remarkably low tech bio bag technology being developed around the corner from where I live in Philadelphia, such that not just the cooking based 
labors of making human bodies, but also the literal gestating of fetuses uh, might be something that we could interrupt, share out, and, you know, crazy as it sounds, um, you know, diffuse across the whole of society in the manner uh, of that, um, that age old forgotten 60s project. Um, so reprodo, <laughs> very close to my Twitter handle, reprodutopia, reprodutopia, oh dear, <laughs> um, is the name of the hospital um, art partnership uh, dreaming up uh, real ectogenetic um, uh, facilities. And there is no illustration of the brooder in Marge Piercy's Women on, on the Edge of Time. So this is the closest, um, paradoxically, <laughs> you know, the real life, um, life imitating art. Um, so um, I've, I've said throughout that I, you know, am committed to a utopian approach. Um, and of course, there are colonialist traditions of utopianism, um, aristocratic ones, eugenicist ones. However, there is also a tradition of the utopian that is decolonial, critical, uh, and committed to the pragmatic insight that capitalism and its basic unit of private property need to die in order for all beings to survive, let alone thrive. I'm inspired by recent calls for a politics of pro-sleeping, pro-dreaming and being asleep which is an appealing revisitation for me of the age old anti-work principle from Marx's day of the right to be lazy, which is a highly necessary component of what I hope can be a widely generalized xenofeminist project um, of architecturally communizing and diffusing equally across everybody's bodies, the gestational workplace. But we can never forget this part. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm in a state of kind of uh, euphoria and you have such a brilliant way of moving between quite sophisticated and, and specific sort of um, theoretical and reference laden formulations and then very direct kind of synthesis of them moves to sort of calls to action, maybe not a phrase you want, but you know, this kind of this kind of motion, I think it's really rare in a, in a thinker. I think that's why your work is so important. And um, I'm just really glad you, you could join this, this series. I'm very happy to have you part of it. As a, as a moderator, it's, it's a nightmare because what I really want to do is just go and like read a lot of things um, and, you know, end this call right now and just go start. But um, I have some questions for you. And um, perhaps the public does too. Um, just a reminder, you can put them in the, in the chat and in, in the Q&A and whatever, raise your hand. Um, someone already asked if the lecture will be you know, available. I think perhaps like me, they're also feeling like they wanted to read <laughs> some of these texts and so on um, and look them up. Um, I put uh, just one link um, to, uh, to a text you mentioned in the chat. Uh, the lecture will be published, of course, um, on YouTube uh, right away, and then again in the slightly um, cleaned up version. But I, yeah, for me, I think that somehow we, coming back to this point about um, the property logic of the family, and then um, this sort of uh, challenge to keep keep doing your best with the imperfect options available. And, and I, I feel like there is, isn't a more clear way of setting out the terms um, of what needs to be done. Um, so I guess, well, my first question uh, is a, a little bit historical in the sense of why, since in many of the earlier social critiques and, and kind of some of the utopias you mentioned, included a critique of the family and in particularly managed to imagine, you know, its abolition or its transformation. Why has this fallen away? This doesn't seem to be part of the criticism anymore. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, I'm actually, yeah, really indebted to the historians for this. I mean, um, there are some fantastic histories um, of the double-edged sword politically of things like marriage enfranchisement, <laughs> uh, just, just limiting myself temporarily to the United States. Um, there's a history by Catherine Frank called Wedlocked, which actually compares um, 
and draws out similarities between the sort of uh, the, the the struggles for access to the marriage form of, on the one hand, formerly enslaved people and uh, gay people, uh, which is a sort of, for me at least, quite um, you know startling and illuminating way of uh, you know drawing out the the necessity to be quite uh, uncomfortably consistent with the, with the critique uh, of property because um, and this is something that Michelle O'Brien is so good at in her very long end notes essay people have um, been bought off <laughs> in a way <laughs> you know it is important to acknowledge that the that for example the the, the European labor movements um, successful fight for access to the male breadwinner, household um, was was a fantastic in many ways thing for people you know it improved living conditions it was a, a hell of a triumph you know it 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 re, you know improved living conditions it reduced all kinds of suffering and at the same time it was a way in which that um, labor struggle differentiated itself from a sort of uh, queered and racialized and lumpen other. So there's this kind of history of, and I don't want to sort of glibly oversimplify because you know there's a specificity always, but I think the general answer to your question of why um, the utopian critique of family has at different moments in history fallen away um, after a moment where it was actually being advanced and held up by some um, is because um, the, the biopolitical state and capital bought off sections of the population by bringing them in uh, to the, the, the property regime uh, or what Angela Mitropoulos calls this kind of uh, oikonomia, right? Oikos, like the, the household, right? And so, you know, um, for a moment after um, the end of slavery in the US, um, black people were actually not allowed to marry, right? And there was this kind of complex like way in which the legitimation of lives in the bourgeois uh, tacitly white model was a kind of win. <laughs> and there are ways in which perhaps one could say, and some black studies uh, philosophers do say it was it was it was not you know right? this is not a house we want to live in <laughs> right so I don't know if that's a sufficient answer I mean I also I also think one cannot overstate how terrible the 80s were <laughs> in terms of actively producing um, forgetfulness and anti-utopianism you know yeah, I am. So I'm very tempted to quote, write down your quotes all the time for, for future t-shirts. Um, no, I think that that, that, that does um, <laughs> answer the question in a great way. Um, and it makes me think of something that um, the other people in the audience have been, have been wondering too, in the sense of relating to the idea of sort of denaturalization, which I see is one of your kinds of strategies that you employ very well in this, in this sort of struggle. Um, I have, it's it's there's two parts to it. One is um, why do you think it's so important? Um, it, it's and, and in a sense, like how do you go about doing it? Uh, obviously, in your writing, it's very clear. Uh, but I, I'm also curious what you think, especially as someone that you know you read people really into architecture before, but somehow maybe this is one of your longer engagements with architecture now because of the limitations. So I still consider you someone, you know, brilliantly on the outside. What do you sense, I mean, really as an instinct is like, could be architecture's contribution to this in a, in a kind of particular or special way, if there is one? I, I think, um, gosh, I'm so, un, I'm so un, un, unequipped to really answer that, but I, I uh, one of my closest uh, friends is uh, actually <laughs> the person who came up originally on a tumbler with the idea of uh, luxury communism or communal luxury, which was then taken up in a very kind of technophilic way that was completely foreign to its original spirit, which is kind of, which is why I bring it up because I feel a bit loyal <laughs> like to credit that original tumbler, which was about 
huge infrastructure projects of public bathing, you know, sort of interact. I mean, I, I have a piece uh, about uh, collective turned offness at Mal magazine, which kind of ends with a bit of a, a riff about all the infrastructures that I think we need to have in order to collectively experience the, you know, erotic in the way that we deserve uh, as as proletarian animals. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's sort of, it's simultaneously true that there's no architectural fix to things. And of course, you know, there, there can't be um, change without architectural components to that change. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm deeply sort of, you know, attached to experiences I've had of momentary transformations of cities via, you know, uh, you know, riots, insurrections, and sort of proliferations of um, insurgent care. You know, there was a, a beautiful thing I read recently in the um, the Boston Review's kind of care anthology by, um, uh, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. DG Kelly, Robin DG Kelly, about the way that the sort of um, glittering image of the burning cop car is actually something that kind of um, it elides sometimes. Not that it's a it's a great thing, but sort of if you like mushrooming all around the burning cop car in history in LA, uh, in the Watts riots, in the 92 riots, and so on. There is this whole kind of ecosystem of transformative use of space and sort of commoning um, of, of, you know, buildings to become kind of uh, community centers or medical provision or whatever. So, you know, um, he did a really nice job of sort of showing how, um, you know, you, yeah, the, the, the two things aren't, you know, care and, uh, you know, Molotov cocktails are not sort of separated, they're part of the same, um, you know, repurposing of the city and, and um, but uh, I don't really know. <laughs> Maybe you could tell me how architecture plays a part. <laughs> no, I, I, I think too deep in it, um, but uh, I think you're, you're, some of the examples you brought up uh, are, are great in this point about infrastructure. Uh, in particular, um, but also to, to me, when you talk about, when you raise topics like the erotic, I mean, I think that's something that architecture, now of course to talk about contemporary architecture, that's a massive generalization, but like has kind of lost touch with, mm. you know, it's difficult to talk now about the, the erotic, let alone something like sort of the, the collective erotic. Um, I think it'd be very interesting, but um, in that sense, I think that's, that's more like choosing a, a relevant, topic that's been forgotten um, that could be interesting in a number of disciplines. Yeah. Uh, I think, although I said I couldn't answer, but maybe I think if, if there is an ability in architecture, I think it has something to do with the visual, something to do with the sort of believability, how convincing um, architecture can be, at least in its sort of visual traditions. I think there is a kind of um, political power there that's at the moment, you know, explored a little bit in school and then forgotten. Um, but uh, there's a capacity there, I think, to sort of make alternatives seem uh, within reach um, that, that architecture doesn't doesn't explore so much. Um, but not as good as as you are, or a lot of contemporary thinkers are, sort of putting things into clear language <laughs> or being kind of pithy or efficient, which I still I still believe you are, despite your oh, thank you thing to the to the contrary. Um, the uh like your title all reproduction is assisted i think is just a brilliant example of that um thank you i'm going to try and bribe the, the audience which i do in in uh personal events all the time which is to say if you ask a question i will get a cca tote bag to you uh we'll have to communicate afterwards so i, so I know where to send it but anyone who asks the first question will get a tote bag so get your <laughs> questions in um and I guess I, I had I had one other uh, one other question while while we wait for someone to take the bait. I mean, I, you you made a, distinct, a distinction between reproductive and and, and gestational labor earlier. Um, so hopefully this isn't too problematic a phrasing, but I think that this 
the, the idea of emotional labor at the office and then reproductive labor in the home has really entered the kind of mainstream discourse uh, in the last uh, years and maybe we could say accelerated by the pandemic. And I'm curious what you think this understanding, maybe misunderstanding, um, does to our ability to think about things like laziness, sleepiness, indolence, particularly pleasure, um, mm. what you think of that? Uh, this is quite a nuanced thing. I, uh, I had, there are sort of wrong and right uh, beef to ha beefs to have with the, uh, the sort of generalization of emotional labor, I think. And it kind of, it's really hard to sort of put your finger to the wind and see what, which way you need to sort of push in what situation. Um, I've noticed that, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, some of the sort of push back against the, you know, the use of it for everything is maybe simply a bit uh, misogynist and unwilling to do certain kinds of thoughtfulness. Uh, particularly when it comes to sort of racialized modes of, you know, uh, aggress aggressive extraction of like vital energy in the social. But um, I think I am really interested and I'm not, yeah, it, it's, it's really a side by side and multiplicity of tactics thing rather than a kind of, but, um, you know, when I say gestational, the idea is partly that there's an openness to the result being productivity or anti-productivity or both at the same time um, because you know part of the problem is just semantic and part of it is much deeper than that when you think about reproduction as a creative or a you know a productive act you can also then think about it as a destructive and an anti-productive one um, so I um, I guess I don't quite know how to bridge that with your your point about the sort of the the the, the rise of um, like calls to sleep more and um, and to do nothing. Um, I guess maybe sometimes I don't really know enough about it. I don't know how you recuperate that. I'm sure people are. <laughs> but I, I mean, the most horrifying thing I you know, one week into moving to the States, I had a conversation with a, a startup on bro who was literally trying to not sleep at all, which he thought was possible with the help of certain kinds of new vitamins and apps and disciplinary regimes for self-improvement. Um, and I love to sleep, which is why, you know, I have a cat around me at all times to remind me um, of, of, my, of my falling short of my goals in this regard. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if we're not sort of linking up in a serious way with, for example, um, you know, the disability uh, theorists or the sick woman theorists, the theorists of the, the ways in which people are increasingly not allowed to sleep or even piss at Amazon warehouses, you know, I suppose a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a freelance writer's kind of, uh, you know, statement of, you know, pro-sleepness can be very, well, you know, limited <laughs> in, its, in its scalability, right? We need to build the conditions for other people with much less control. I mean, I'm not assuming everyone here has as much choice over the, the use of their time. I also have a workaholism project problem and an overwork problem as, as many of us do at the same time, you know, <laughs> that there is a bit more flexibility and a bit more choice. Um, choice is really also something I, I, I stumbled on when I was looking at some of the kitchenless uh, ness kinds of conversations, because um, it is only a few of us in the kind of family abolition milieu who are willing to talk about the coerciveness inevitably. Of, of, of this politics, right? It's not it's not really going to fly to say, oh yeah, you know, you can, you, if you want to just, you know, uh, <laughs> carry on doing, doing the private nuclear household, you can, that's fine. But I mean, of course, in a certain sense, that's not very meaningful because the history of projects to abolish the family speculate that 
you know, when you remove the economic functions and the state and legal functions of the family, then you have essentially abolished the family and you'd have to sort of speculative, you know, how would people's desires shift? Would, would there be a sort of moment where, you know, a bit like uh, the road runner when he's run off the cliff, you know, people would still be kind of acting like they were doing private nuclear households when there was no sort of biopolitical or, um, you know, economic reason to, to do that anymore. And that's not something we can really say, right? And yeah. Kathy Weeks has an amazing line in her recent essay about how family abolition may be something that we are not in our current moment even sufficiently equipped to desire, right? Like we can't even really desire it. It is a name for a struggle of the longest possible haul, right? <laughs> Being in it for the long haul. Is, is, is what she says in relation to family abolition. That was a big ramble, but the coerciveness element is, is, is there uh, in a text called Kinder Kommunismus um, by Jules Gleason and Kate Doyle Griffiths, who, who insist that while their proposed institution of counter social reproduction, the, the communist crash for all generations would abolish coercion, it would also be coercive. And this, yeah, you know, that's just a sort of dialectical move. But um, it, yeah, you know, I, I, I sometimes notice that there is an inability in neoliberal policy circumstances to talk about actually taking away the option of certain things from people, right? Like, what if you weren't really able to use your car? <laughs> like, in some circumstances, like, that's the unsayable thing, right? Oh, you know, just provide, you know, lots of great public transport infrastructure. Yeah, like, absolutely do that. But, you know, desire is a strange thing like even I I started driving a year ago uh, and I like it so much and it's such a death machine <laughs> and I, you know, I, I I you know you're gonna have to prize the the delicious autonomous you know death machine out of my hands and I'm a utopianist right like make me not have a car <laughs> like let us collectively you know make it kind of both possible and and impossible to to, to, to build um, joy and, you know, to, to harm, like, you know, let us, let us take away the means of the production of harm from ourselves and each other. I really want to thank Sophie uh, for a wonderful talk. Um, also, all the other speakers, um, Frida Escobedo, Valentina Davila, Wendy Gamber, and Jamie Jacobs, um, but especially also everyone at CCA, my colleagues, um, in particular, Gabriel Farardo, Jim Bell, and Yimi Provenzal without whom none of this uh, is possible. And thank you all very, very much for watching. So merci beaucoup uh, et à la prochaine fois. Bye everyone.